Hey, what is up Thrive Austin Church community? It's Pastor Scott and I am bringing you today's devotional. I hope that your week is off to a fantastic start and it really is such a joy and such a privilege to join with you guys every single week as we dig into God's Word, as we ask God, God, what are you saying to us through your word and then allowing those words to come to penetrate our hearts and our minds and to bring transformation in our lives and i'm really excited because at thrive we have started a brand new series called emotionally healthy spirituality and this last weekend we talked about what does it look like to have an emotionally unhealthy kind of spirituality and we looked at a case study we looked at Saul, King Saul and his life and some of the mistakes that he made and some of the ways that he was an emotionally unhealthy person. We talked about how we can learn from his story and how we can become more emotionally healthy people in our lives. And the whole premise behind this series is basically that it is impossible for you to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Pete Scazzaro, the author of the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says it is impossible to remain spiritually mature while being emotionally immature. In other words, in order for us to grow as followers of Jesus, in order for us to thrive, in order for us to truly become the people that God has created us to be, to live out of our true selves, out of our true identity, what Pete Scazzaro says is that we have to experience a transformation of our whole selves, not just our mind, not just our soul, but even our emotions as well and uh, this last weekend we talked about the iceberg analogy and how people are mostly like icebergs what we see on the surface really only represents about 10 percent of who a person really is it's actually what lurks beneath the surface that few people actually invite jesus into and so so oftentimes we focus on what does the tip of the iceberg look like how does the 10 percent look that the rest of the world sees and so we focus on dressing that up and looking really really good on the outside and sometimes we we practice we even engage in spiritual practices we might engage in prayer and scripture study and worship and all of these wonderful things giving to the church financially all, all these great things we serve and on the outside everything looks really really good yet when you start to get beneath the surface it's not as pretty as what we see on the outside and sometimes the closer people get to you the more they get to know you the more you begin to open yourself up and reveal yourself to others. If we haven't invited Jesus into the 90%, when people get close and when people see what's underneath the surface, if we haven't invited Jesus into those areas, then other people can get hurt. And sometimes it's events like pandemics, like stress, like pressure, like anxiety, major life events that oftentimes cause the 90% that's underneath the surface to be exposed to the rest of the world. And again, if we're not inviting Jesus to do a complete, total transformation of our whole selves, not just the 10% that all the world sees, when that 90% comes out and it's revealed, it can often be devastating and hurtful to other people and so we want Jesus to come in and to transform all of it and really a, a perfect case study of emotionally unhealthy spirituality a perfect case study in somebody who was focused more on his outward appearance than his inner life with God would have been King Saul now, if you're familiar with the story of King Saul, King Saul is anointed king by the prophet Samuel. Saul was one of those guys that if you looked at him, you would say, this guy has it all together. He was a religious man. He was tall. He was handsome. He was charismatic. He was a great warrior. He was a military genius. He led the Israelites into military victory, and God had anointed him as king. But what we find in the story is that Saul was so focused on what everybody else in the world saw. He was so focused on his outward, visible relationship with God and neglected his inner relationship with God. And as a result, his unhealthy spirituality caused a lot of problems, not only for himself, 
but for others around him. And really the beginning of his demise is in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we really see the story of how Saul's inner life with God, his, his inner brokenness, his inner toxic spirituality causes problems for himself. And the context is this. God delivered a word to Saul, asking Saul to go in and invade the Amalekite people. And he wanted Saul to go in and destroy the Amalekite people completely. He wanted him to wipe them from the face of the earth. And so Saul says, okay, God, I'll do exactly as you have called me to do. And so he goes and he leads the Israelite army. God delivers the Amalekites into his hand. But instead of completely wiping out the Amalekites, what does Saul do? Saul decides to keep the best of all of the spoils, the best of the booty, right? After defeating the Amalekite people, he decides to keep that all to himself. Instead of fully obeying the commandment that God had given him, he only partially obeyed. And the results were, were devastating for Saul. And I just want to ask you today, have you ever been in a situation in your life before, or maybe are you even in a situation right now where God is calling you into something, where God has called you to do something, perhaps it's a ministry, perhaps it's reaching out to an individual, perhaps it's investing your life in a particular area, sharing the gospel, some, whatever it is, but you are only partially obeying Him? I remember when I first became a follower of Jesus, like Jesus was very clear to me early on. I mean, it was within just a few months of becoming a follower of Jesus. He told me, I am going to use you to pastor, to shepherd. I'm going to use you to start a new work, to be a church planter, to father a church, to begin a church, to found a church from the ground up. And man, I was really, really excited. And so I took all of the steps knowing that God had called me into ministry, knowing that God had called me to be a pastor. I took all the steps to do that. So I went to school. I got a degree in theology. Uh, I started interning at the church that, that I had uh, grown up in or come up in the faith in where I had come to faith in Jesus at. And uh, once I finished my undergraduate in Christianity, I actually came on staff at the church there. And it wasn't long before I was an associate pastor. And man, I'll tell you what, I loved it. I got to lead in all different areas of ministry, lots and lots of volunteers, lots and lots of people. I had a lot of people surrounding me who really, really loved me. It was an incredible nurturing environment, a lot of mature, strong, faith-filled people. It was incredible. It was awesome. And what happened was, was, was I started to get comfortable. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, God, I know you called me to be a pastor and I'm pastoring, you know, so, so this is great. This is awesome. I could see myself doing this forever. The only problem was, was I was only partially obeying God. You see, God did tell me that I was called to pastor, but he also told me that I was called to start a new church, to be a lead pastor, a senior pastor. And here I had gotten comfortable. I was comfortable with my situation. I was comfortable being where I was. I had a lot of security and things were wonderful, but I wasn't being fully obedient to God. And it wasn't long before God started to instill me with this sense of being discontent. And before I knew it, I wasn't exactly comfortable with my situation anymore. It's like I knew that God was calling me to more and that I needed to take a step of faith. And ultimately, through a, a, a two-year process of discernment and praying and working with other people who were praying for me and asking me discernment-type questions and working with coaches and spiritual directors, that we felt God's specific call to move to Austin, Texas and to plant a church, a place where people would connect with God and thrive. And so that's the story of how God brought us. But there was a season there where I was only partially obeying God. Everything on the outside looked great. Even the ministries that I led, they were thriving. I mean, dozens of people were coming to faith in Jesus. We were seeing renewal among our young adults ministry. People were getting saved. Some of them have gone on to be worship leaders and uh, pastors in other churches. And these are people that I led to faith in Jesus and discipled. And things were great. There was fruit everywhere. It was wonderful. The only problem was was I wasn't being fully obedient to Jesus. 
I was only partially obeying God. And I think sometimes in our lives, God can call us to something and we might take a step of faith, but it's, it's not like we're taking the full step of faith. God might call, be calling somebody to be a pastor, and instead of being a pastor, maybe they're only serving in the church a little bit more. Or God might be calling you to take a big step and to even possibly move your family and do missions somewhere. And so you think, well, I'm just going to invest in missions somewhere instead of actually fully obeying. You see, Saul here, he had all the best intentions, right? I mean, on the outside, everything looked good. God gave him a command. He called him to do something. But instead of doing it fully, he only partially obeyed God. Everything looked really, really great on the outside. But inwardly, he was not being truly obedient to God. And I think sometimes in our lives, we can get more focused on what the outside looks like than our inner life of obedience to God. We can can look and we can say, oh, well, I really serve a lot, or I give a lot, or I do a lot, or, you know, I'm involved in my church, you know, I I serve once a week and I do all that, but, but really God is calling us into more. And we're really being disobedient to what what God has called us to do. And sometimes this sort of activity, this sort of um, behavior is indicative of a lack of an inner life with God. A lack of an inner life with God. Sometimes when we are lacking in an inner life with God, meaning that we are meeting with God daily, and I'm not just talking about reading through the Bible, I'm not just talking about, you know, reciting some prayers and then being done with it. I'm talking about sitting at the feet of Jesus. I'm talking about going into the presence of God who knows your heart even better than you know it yourself and taking time daily, even multiple times throughout the day to say, Lord, here I am. Examine my heart. Come, help me to see myself as you see me. What are you calling me to do? Not just in the future, not just big picture type stuff. What are you calling me to do right now? What are you asking me to do in this next meeting that I'm about to walk into? What are you calling me to uh, be and become in my family relationships, in my work relationships? Like right here, right now, God, what are you calling me to do? You see, sometimes when we are lacking an inner life with God, We get very, very focused on what the outside looks like. And we get so focused on making sure that the tip of the iceberg looks really, really good for all the world to see, but we neglect what's underneath the surface. And if we're not careful, if we do that, especially over a prolonged period of time, when an event happens, when a crisis happens, and that iceberg is flipped over for all the world to see, sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it's ugly. And sometimes people get hurt. And I'm just going to be real as a pastor through the course of this coronavirus pandemic, you see, you see what, uh, uh, you see what's underneath the surface as this pressure, as this anxiety and tension begins to weigh on people, what's beneath the surface begins to come to the top. And we start to see, you know, who really has a strong, true relationship with God? Who really has a deep inner life with God? Is this person full of anxiety and stress and tension and worry constantly? Are they hard to communicate with, isolated, walling themselves off from other people? You know, these are all behaviors of emotionally unhealthy people like... Or are they a a calming presence in the midst of panic? Are they strong and steady? Are they persevering even through difficult times? Are they showing that even in the midst of a struggle, even in the midst of a panic, like they will press forward, forward. They will be like a rock planted in the middle of a river. And as the waters of panic and fear and anxiety wash over it, you stay firm and secure right there, unmoved, unmovable, like a tree with its roots planted deep. And as the winds of, of fear and panic rage on, You stay planted right where you are. See, Saul 
had a really, really good public life with God, but his inner life was what struggled. Now Saul thought to himself, well, I don't see what's wrong. I did partially obey God. I did go in and I did defeat the Amalekites. I don't get what's wrong. And so when Samuel comes and he condemns, condemns him and he says that the Lord has rejected him as king, Saul offers an excuse. And he says, well, it was the soldiers. And can't you see also I've been burning all of these sacrifices to the Lord. Again, his outer life with God looked really, really good. Saul was doing a lot of great things for God, but he was neglecting to truly be with God, to listen to God, to be obedient to God. He was focused on doing things for God instead of having a relationship, an inner life with God that was focused on listening and obeying. And so... Uh, the result is this in verse 22 it says but Samuel replied does the Lord delight in your burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as your obedience to obey is better than sacrifice in other words to listen and to do what God tells you is better than whatever image you are projecting on the outside and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. Again, Saul was focused on what everything looked like on the outside, and he neglected his inner life with God. And I think that all of us, if we're really, really honest, we can be guilty of the very th same thing. There's a little bit of Saul inside of all of us. I'll be the first one to admit, there's a little bit of Saul inside of me that there have been times in my life where I have been so consumed with all of the things that I'm doing for God, preaching sermons. There have been se seasons of my life where my devotional life consisted of my study and preparation for sermons. And that's a dangerous place to be. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm doing good. I'm actually reading God's Word. I'm, I'm preparing to preach. But I'm, I'm neglecting to spend just that intentional time in the presence of the Lord where I have no agenda. I'm just totally going to God to be at the feet of Jesus and to hear what He would say to me so that I know that I'm being obedient to what He has called me to do. I've gone through seasons like that in my life and I know what it's like. And I think that's the question that I want everyone to consider. I want you to consider. Where is the Saul inside of you? Where is the Saul inside of you? Are you in a season right now where your inner life with God is struggling? Your inner life with God is suffering? Maybe you're not spending time in prayer. Maybe you don't know how to spend time in prayer. And if that's the case, please reach out to me and I would be more than happy to coach you, to help you in that. There's lots of great resources and tools and how to come into the presence of the Lord and hear from Him and all of that. But maybe you're in a season where you're doing some things for God and on the outside everything looks good. Inwardly, you're, you're struggling. Beneath the surface, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiety. And I believe that the Lord wants to come into that part of your life as well and bring transformation. I've seen Him do it in my heart numerous times throughout the years. I've seen Him do it in other people's hearts, and I believe that He'll do it for you as well. Again, Jesus doesn't just want to transform the 10%. He wants to transform the 90%. And it begins with asking, where is the Saul inside of me? Where do I tend to focus on what everyone else in the world sees and neglect my inner relationship with God and what He is saying to me? And then take a step to prioritize creating space in your life to regularly commune with God, hearing from Him, listening to what He has to say, and then obeying. That's my hope for you, and that's my prayer. And one of the great ways that you can do that and be held accountable is to get involved in one of our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality small groups that kicks off this week. The women's group meets on Thursdays at 6 p.m. The men's group meets on Saturdays at 8 a.m. We also have a series that we're going through. I just invite you, get involved, 
get connected. Let's focus on building our inner life with Jesus, our daily prayer time, our daily connection with Him, hourly connection with Him. Let's focus on that and see as God brings transformation in our lives throughout the course of these next few weeks. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray. I pray for every single person watching this devotional today. Lord, that you would just bless them. Lord, that you would come and that you would invade the 90%, not just the 10% that everyone sees, but the 90%, that which is beneath the surface. And Lord, that you would begin to bring transformation in those dark places, those hidden places, those places that nobody else sees. Bring, do a work, bring your transformation. Lord, I pray for health, for spiritual maturity and emotional maturity just to flourish and thrive in this faith community. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have a great rest of your week. Thanks for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a like, give it a share, pass it on to somebody else who might benefit from it. Have a great day, y'all.